Okay, hello. Um, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Walk Japan's uh, Talk Japan series uh, once again. Um, the number of participants is steadily ticking up, so lovely to see so many people here this morning. Um, I'm Lou, uh, Walk Japan's Managing Director, and um, a big pleasure today for me to introduce my colleague and, um, and a very, very influential person in my life too, um, Mr. John McBride, who will talk about traveling on Japan's greatest highway, the Tokaido. Um, I first traveled with John, was lucky enough to do so, um, on the Tokaido during cherry blossom season in, in 2013. So not far from being 10 years ago, and, and that was a, a, a great and, and an eye-opening experience in, in many ways. Um, now, before we go ahead and begin the talk, um, I'd like to just give you some guidelines so that you can make the most of today's presentation. Um, you, you will have noticed you're, you're unable to use your microphone or video. Uh, we've done this on purpose in order to protect your privacy. Um, you're, you're obviously welcome to contact us throughout the presentation using the chat function on, on your Zoom screen. Now, depending on the device that you're using, you might have different options to select the chat. Um, some devices obscure the chat button behind sort of th three little dots or, or, or or icons which may be placed on one of the corners of your screen. Um, if you have any problems or questions, please contact us using that chat. And also, um, please do use it to ask questions about the talk or, or, or about any other matters, which we'll do our best to answer at the end of the talk. Um, please don't wait. Um, ask your questions as, as they pop into your mind so that we can collate them and put them together for the end of the talk. If we don't have time, to answer all of those questions, then, then don't worry about that. We'll, um, we'll send a follow-up email to all participants um, a few days after the end of the talk. Um, a, a recording of this event, um, we, we will tidy up the recording and, and, and make it available for a short period of time on Walk Japan's Vimeo channel. And um, we'll also be sending a link to this recording to all participants who, for whatever reason, were not able to attend as planned, all registered participants. Um, we'll also be sending a feedback survey, and, um, and we'd be very grateful if you could take a little bit of time to complete this. It can help us improve on, on what we do, as, as well as plan uh, future events for everyone. Um, and now, without further ado, I will hand over to John. Thank you very much, John. Great, thanks, Lou, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us today to talk about our Tokaido tours. My remarks uh, will be focused on our Tokaido Wayfarer tour. Our Wayfarer tours are our self-guided tours. We do have a guided Tokaido tour, and all my comments are relevant to that tour. Uh, but I think the Tokaido lends itself very well to self-guided walking as the public transport options along the way are very convenient. Now, I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment because I want to uh, introduce you to my uh, pride and joy. Um, this is the, the sixth volume, uh, Tokaido Meisho Zue. Uh, this is a first edition of uh, this very important guidebook to the Tokaido published in 1797. Um, it smells, uh, smells wonderful. It's like being in an old uh, bookstore. Uh, and uh, it's an illustrated guide. About 30% of the book is illustrated. We'll start our walk today here at uh, the Nihonbashi, the Bridge of Japan. Um, and uh, it's uh, a beautiful book with uh, woodblock printed uh, pre-modern text. I've spent 40 years of my life uh, with tears in my eyes trying to read uh, this text, but uh, I'll use this to guide us down the, the Tokaido today. So a little bit about myself first. Um, I completed my undergraduate degree at a national university in Tokyo. And 
<clears throat> at that time, I was majoring in pre-modern uh, Japanese literature, uh, classical Japanese literature, and I asked my tutor to read with me uh, this book called the Tokaido Chu Hizakurige, uh, which was published about 20 years after our guidebook. And it's a comedic novel following two mischievous characters as they walk down uh, from their hometown Edo, today's Tokyo, to Kyoto. Uh, the book is available in translation. And uh, in translation, it's called Shanks Mare. And it's one of two books that I'd suggest you read. Um, and I think you'll find it enjoyable in preparation for your walk along the Tokaido. Now, um, at the end of my first year of university, I followed in the foot footsteps of the two protagonists in this novel, Yaji and Kita. And I took with me <clears throat> Hiroshige's woodblock prints, his famous series, The 53 Stations of the Tokaido. And uh, I photographed um, with hundreds of photographs, the old sections of the highway. And I tried to recreate at the post town some of the scenes depicted in Hiroshige's woodblock prints. Now, um, this was the age before selfies and uh, of those hundreds of photographs, uh, there's only one of myself. And I'm looking very pleased with myself because I've just crossed, spent two days crossing the Hakone mountain pass in uh, quite deep snow. And I've got to the other side to Mishima. We're going to cross the Hakone Pass today together, and we're gonna stay at Mishima, which is a, a much warmer part of, uh, of, the, of uh, Japan. Um, I went on to work at the Australian National University, had a, a corporate career in Japan, and I've been working with uh, Lou at Walk uh, Japan since 2012. Now, a very, very brief history of the Tokaido. Uh, it's first mentioned in 720 CE in the Chronicles of Japan, and it's referred to as an administrative district um, <clears throat> extending to the east from the capital area of Nara. And of course, to administer this sort of uh, district, you need a, a road system. And this road system consolidated into what we know as the Tokaido today. And we're actually going to walk on uh, one of the original sections of this eighth century road today. And then about 900 years later, uh, when the new Edo Tokugawa shogunate established its new military government in Edo, today's Tokyo, they also needed to administer the country uh, and provide for a postal system. And so they improved the highway dramatically. The shogunate postal runners were known as hikyaku, which is a wonderful word. It means flying feet. And indeed, these runners could run a message from the shogun in Edo to the emperor in Kyoto in just three days. Urgent messages took 40 days. And to enable this to happen safely, the highway had to be very uh, safe and flat. For the most part, wheeled traffic was banned, so there were no ruts on which these runners could trip. About 30 years after that, the shogunate started requiring 250 feudal lords uh, or provincial lords from around the country, known as daimyo, to travel up to Edo annually uh, to undertake uh, to, to meet with the, the shogun and pay their respects to the shogun. Um, and so the infrastructure of the highway was improved dramatically. The inns at the post towns that you could stay at, the tea houses, uh, the, the, um, the, the porters and horses that were available for travelers and the luggage forwarding services were all dramatically improved. And so with these highways, Edo became the center of the nation, the shogunate, maintained five of these highways, and the feudal lords all had to build their own highways, which linked in to these five uh, major highways. At E is our Tokaido, hugging the Pacific coastline. The alternate route was at D, the Nakasendo, for which Walk Japan is so well regarded, our guided tour of the Nakasendo. Uh, 
and uh, there were three other uh, uh, minor highways. Edo was the center of the nation's life, and the center of Edo was the Nihonbashi Bridge, which was the zero kilometer marker for all of these highways. It was the terminus or perhaps the start point of uh, the Tokaido. So as I mentioned, the Tokaido had 53 stations. They were spaced about two hours walking distance. And so just as you were starting to feel a bit thirsty or a bit hungry, there was another post town where you could rest. It was a challenging walk. There were 13 major river crossings and two open sea crossings. And so there was an alternate route. The Tokaido took 16 days to walk from Edo to Kyoto. The alternate route took two days longer because it was through the mountains, but it was a little bit safer. It was perhaps easier for women to travel on because there weren't the embarrassing river crossings. And so the Nakasendo was sometimes called the Princess Highway. And the post towns were a little bit closer apart because you were traveling through uh, the mountains. The walk profile is up in the top left there. And you can see uh, that <clears throat> The blue line is the Tokaido, reasonably flat, with two mountain passes uh, in the east, close to Tokyo. That's the Hakone Pass, which we're going to walk over today. And in the west, the Suzuka Pass. Some motor aficionados might recognize the name Suzuka from the Suzuka circuit. And the gray line is our Nakasendo, uh, which is flat at the ends. Uh, but passes through this mountainous district in the in the center, which is our well regarded walk through the Kiso uh, mountain valley. Uh, and this is the guide that I showed you that uh, I'm going to use to guide you along uh, the highway today. It was designed for armchair travel, but it did encourage many people to get out and actually walk on the highway. And uh, as it, I hope it will for you too uh, today. So I'm going to talk about our Tokaido Wayfarer Tour, which begins in Hakone, and will guide you uh, using the train system to get from Tokyo down to Hakone. But most of you will start in Tokyo. You'll likely land at Haneda Airport. Um, and so I do suggest that you at least go and visit uh, the Nihonbashi Bridge, which is our uh, starting point for the Tokaido. And if you like me, you might decide to stroll down the Tokaido through along Japan's main shopping avenue. And you might even get as far as Shinagawa, which is the first post town on uh, the Tokaido. This is about two hours stroll uh, down the Tokaido. Our guidebook starts at the Nihonbashi Bridge and it's described uh, very accurately. And uh, my translation of this first little introduction is uh, the Nihonbashi Bridge, adorned with brass fittings and a high railing. The Nihonbashi Bridge stands at the center of Edo and distances in all directions are measured from it. The road which extends from here to the Sanjo Ohashi Bridge in the capital of Kyoto is known as the Tokaido. It has 53 post stations and is 491 kilometers long. And so indeed the bridge is featured in the illustration with its high railing and its brass adornments on the railings. In the background, oh sorry, uh, in the background is Edo Castle, which is today's imperial palace, uh, equated with the lofty, sacred nature of Mount Fuji in the background there. At the base of the bridge is the bustling Kitchen of Edo, Edo's fa uh, famous fish market. And uh, you can see the delicious tuna that's uh, on sale in the market. Uh, much like, as you'll see in the new fish market of Tokyo today, at Toyosu. And our Tokaido starts on the far side of the bridge. And the guide takes us uh, from Nihonbashi Bridge down this uh, shopping avenue. This, this is the bridge today, 
It is the 19th generation, the first granite form of the bridge. Uh, all bridges until that time were made from wood. And it's covered by this monstrosity of a, uh, an expressway, which was built for the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. Uh, this is the last, uh, uh, the 18th generation wooden bridge, looking much like uh, the version in our guide. This photograph was taken by a photojournalist, an Australian photojournalist uh, in 1872. The good news is that the government has announced that it, it has allocated funding uh, to bury the expressway under the Nihonbashi River at a huge expense. Uh, work is not due to start until 2040. I'm gonna be 80 years of age. So uh, I hope I live to see blue skies returned to this, uh, I think one of the most important monuments in Tokyo. Now, our guide continues down the street through uh, Ginza Cho, Ginza Town, to Shimbashi, and then on to the, into the distance, you can see Shinagawa Post Town, our first post town. This is the main shopping street today, the Ginza. And we'll pass by a couple of my favorite shops, Maruzen, which has fantastic English books about Japan on the third floor there. And uh, my absolute favorite, Itoya uh, uh, Japanese stationery store, which is six floors of the most beautiful stationery you could imagine. And our guide also points us in the right direction to uh, look at the shops along the street, in particular publishers, because of course, uh, the publisher wants to promote his own business. Um, we're guided to two of Edo's noted publishers, Masuya on the left, and Izumiya on the right, which was in business for over 200 years. The front of the store is a high-class courtesan. She has four uh, maids, girls who are in training to be geisha. And she's very portable. She has her bedding being carried by her male servant in the background there. And she's just brushing the top of the hand of a very senior samurai there with two swords. Uh, perhaps she's saying, you know, come up and see my woodblock prints tonight. And uh, we have a couple of enlightened fellows here, they're window shopping, uh, looking at some woodblock prints. Uh, one fellow is an enlightened father, he's got his looking after his child for the day, kids on his, on his back, and he's looking at this uh, perspective print of the interior of a kabuki theatre. And this is of interest to me because these prints were started by Utagawa Toyoharu, who was studying Western art and reintroducing the concept of perspective into Japanese art, which had been lost uh, for a time. Toyoharu is important because he's the founder of the Utagawa school, of which Hiroshige uh, is a member of our, our 53 stations of the Tokaido artist. Now we continue along uh, to, sorry, um, Takanawa, in the main southern gate of the city. And uh, these stone rampants still survive. Uh, and uh, the little, I'm reminded of a little ditty from Shanks Mayor, which goes, uh, Takanawa e kite wasuretaru koto bakari. Uh, and my translation is, we remember what we've forgotten when we get to Takanawa. And I think when we all get traveling again, we might be a bit like this. Uh, you would leave Nihonbashi in the dark and you would get to Takanawa. At first light, you'd extinguish your lantern and you'd remember that you'd forgotten your passport or your rain jacket. I think we'll all, we're all a bit rusty with travel at the moment. We might all be a, a bit like this. Uh, just past these rampants uh, is a staircase up to Sengakuji Temple. And uh, this temple, of course, still stands. It's famous for the story about the 47 Ronin, which is a story that occurred in 1701 when their lord, 
Lord Asano was slighted by the horrible Lord Kira, uh, and Lord Asano drew his sword in um, uh, the Edo castle. And this was strictly prohibited, and so he was required to commit uh, suicide. And it took his retainers another two years to serve their revenge cold. They assassinated Lord Kira and brought his uh, head and presented it at the grave of their Lord Asano at Sengakuji Temple. And then in turn, they were all required to commit suicide and their graves are all here at uh, Sengakuji Temple. And then just a few steps down the road is our first post town, Shinagawa. Now, Shinagawa didn't really function as a proper post town because it was so close to Edo, no one would actually stay here. So it prospered as a center of tea houses and courtesans. And uh, this atmosphere is very well described historically, very accurately in one of my favorite Japanese films, Sun in the Last Days of the Shogunate. Filmed in 57, it's voted as one of the best films uh, from Japan by experts in Japan. Set in 1862, just at the end of the Edo period, foreigners are already arriving in Japan, which is one reason that there's so much pressure on the shogunate. Um, and they're being attacked along the Tokaido. The courtesans are as busy as ever. And nori is being, edible seaweed is being grown off the shore. And this is what I'd like you to focus on in this uh, film clip at the end of the film clip. Um, this is Shinagawa in 1957, and the film is set 90 years before this uh, in a very busy tea house. And this is our protagonist who has a big night in the tea house, but informs the, the tea house the next morning but he, that he can't afford to pay the bill. And so he's required to work in the tea house and pay off his bill. The foreigners along the Tokaido are being attacked, um, and the courtesans are as busy as ever. They're telling each and every customer that they can't possibly live without them, but they say the same thing to every customer. And uh, they have the blackened teeth of the courtesans. Uh, the owners of the inn are working at the all-important counting station, making up the bills uh, for present presentation to the customers the next morning. And uh, we still have baths like this in the inns along our walks. Now look at this brushwood that is uh, placed in tidal flats off the coast of Shinagawa. And this is being used as clutch for uh, cultivating nori or edible seaweed. And our guide tells us that the most famous thing to look at along the Shinagawa coastline is uh, look out for this clutch. And you'll also see a beautiful handmade asakusa nori being made along the, uh, along the way. Now, all of this land, all of these tidal flats have, have now been uh, reclaimed. But when you come in from Haneda Airport on the monorail, you'll pass by all of these, these uh, 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 flats where the nori was grown. Um, and in fact, uh, the Omori Nori Museum still is, stands to explain all about uh, this history. And uh, I wouldn't suggest you walk down there, but there's a train right to the front of the uh, the museum and the museum tells you how nori is grown. Now, um, you'll think I'm mad, but I'm off to Wales in, in August to enjoy a Welsh breakfast. Um, the owner of one of the owners of our company, uh, Clu Clewellyn Thomas, is a good Welshman. Um, I'm sure he can tell us all about uh, Welsh breakfasts. But I discovered that uh, nori is eaten in China, Korea, and Japan. Japan stole the technology from Korea at the end of the 16th century. The only other country that eats nori in the world is Wales. And uh, a Welsh breakfast is nori, what, lava bread, lava toast, bacon, and cockles. And then I discovered that uh, at the end of World War II, um, all of the nori beds died out in Tokyo Bay because of pollution. Uh, 
and we're in dire straits. But a Manchester University based psychologist, Kathleen Mary Drew Baker, discovered the life cycle of Noddy. And she discovered the first half of the life cycle is undertaken inside uh, another a, a shell. And this discovery enabled Japan in 1953 to start artificially cultivating nori. And so she is worshipped as a god, a mother of the sea. And most nori today in Japan is grown down in Kyushu and around the inland sea area of Japan. And every year, the crusty old nori farmers of Kyushu get together and worship her. Um, I'm sure a lot of academics around the world would love to be worshipped as a deity, uh, uh, giving thanks for their, for their research. The best nori is harvested in the depths of winter, so it's a, a bitter undertaking. There's still some handmade nori made in Japan, the famous asakusa nori. So if you ever get to eat this type of nori, pay the money and uh, you'll never go back uh, to artificially cultivated nori, which, you know, we wrap up our sushi and whatnot in today. And I did find one photograph of the brushwood tidal flats off uh, Shinagawa. Now, um, we haven't even begun our walk yet. Uh, let's do so. This is our day two. At day one, we get you up to Hakone Yumoto. And uh, day two, we're going to walk over the Hakone uh, Pass. It's just 7.7 .7 kilometers of walking, but don't underestimate the elevation gain of 630 odd meet meters. Um, our Wayfarer tour guides usually suggest two or three distances for the day. So the people who are fighting fit and really want to stride out from the early morning um, are able also to walk longer distances. But there's so much to see on this day, perhaps you might consider this recommendation. We start down at Hakone Yumoto, and our guide tells us that the famous product of Hakone Yumoto are, are turned wooden objects and parquetry veneer. And uh, we see the Izuya store selling these turned wooden objects, much as you'll see in Hakone Yumoto today. And some of them are covered with this special veneer, which I'll describe in a moment. Um, this is actually the Tokaido, but we suggest you catch a bus from here up to the trailhead the next morning. Uh, this is what the Tokaido looked like at the end of the Edo period, this exact location. Now, our, our guide shows us uh, a typical hot spring hotel in the area, just up the street at Tornosoa. We've got lots of suggestions for exploring this valley. The very top of the valley is the wonderful outdoor uh, sculpture park. So it pays to pr probably go up early in the morning and spend a day exploring this area. And uh, the trailhead is uh, just a short bus ride up, uh, up the, uh, the main street. Now, this is our guide describing a hot spring hotel. Uh, the fellow on the left there has been sitting in the hot waters and is now cooling on the balcony. Perhaps he's going to have a game of uh, go afterwards, chess afterwards. And uh, the courtesans on the right hand side, they're very curious to see uh, what gentlemen are in for the evening. Uh, the gentlemen are enjoying a hot bath. Uh, of course, ba bathing in Japan is segregated now. Uh, and I'll translate for you the the pre-modern text that you see um, there. Among the seven hot springs of Hakone, the mountain waters of Tornosawa are particular, particularly picturesque. The inn provides sophisticated rooms and the inside bath draws water through a pipe to create a waterfall which massages the shoulders, hips and back and other ailing spots. It's possible to take of the waters day and night to your heart's content, the free flowing spring waters never cease. Between taking of the waters, one can listen to music, play archery, or listen to tales of military valor. All the activities are restorative and good for one's health. So enjoy the hot springs for the evening. Um, you see the advertising, the, the target there is advertising for the archery practice. Dinners arriving, the fresh river fish, uh, the hoarding there is for uh, 
uh, advertising narration of tales of military valor. And uh, the two blind minstrels there are women. Uh, they're carrying their biwa or lutes, and they will sing uh, the tales of military valor uh, to keep you entertained. Now, um, this is the trailhead. Uh, we suggest you start walking from here. Uh, it follows the Sukumo River up uh, the Hakone Pass. Uh, the road is very well formed with lots of, uh, this is actually Meiji period, but uh, Edo period paving. This is actually the Tokaido, although our guidebook suggests that it's a bit safer perhaps to cross at the bridge uh, further, further up, particularly when that river's in flood. And you'll pass by some very good uh, examples of Edo period paving um, over little creek crossings, and uh, this is perhaps some of the best examples of Edo period paving on the Tokaido. You know it's proper Edo period paving when there's a little bit of space between the cobblestones, which allow some purchase for the horses and the travelers walking up the, uh, the slopes. And then we get to our first intermediate post town. Now these uh, were located just before difficult mountain passes or difficult river crossings. And this one is famous because uh, Hakone Parketry Veneer was started in this village uh, known as Yosegi Zaiku. And uh, uh, you can hear the artisans working on the second floors and often you're welcome to go up and have a look at them working. But these are long uh, strips of wood that have been glued together and then are shaved off to create the veneer, which is uh, pasted onto the turned wooden objects. Also in Hatajuku is our first Ichirizuka, which is a distance mound that was placed every four kilometers along the Tokaido. That's the distance you can walk in one hour. It was a good way of keeping pace, making sure that you were making good uh, uh, progress for the day. And uh, there were two mounds on either side of the highway and a tree planted on top to keep the soil in place. Uh, on the left here, the signatory tree is a zelkova, which is Japan's famous hardwood, a very expensive timber in Japan. We continue on through the Hakone Dake bamboo forests, and the locals would cut this very thin bamboo down and line the Tokaido, uh, but this had to be done every year, so eventually they decided to uh, pave it with, with cobblestones. And uh, the slopes continue. Each of the slopes has a name. This one, Sarusuberi slope, which is even monkeys slip down this slope. But as you can see, there's a safer area on the left there. Very slippery when it's wet, so take care. And then we get to our suggested lunch spot, which is an Edo period tea house called Amazake Tea House. And a very warm and welcoming uh, place. There's always a fire lit because the smoke keeps the thatch roof dry and free of insects. And uh, we suggest you try the famous Edo period food, which is always pounded rice cake and covered in a delicious sweet syrup and, uh, and um, grated or, or um, uh, pounded sesame seeds. Now the drink there is the namesake of the tea house, amazake, which is sweet sake. It's not alcoholic. It's the first step of the process of brewing sake, turning starch to sugar, but yeast is not introduced to turn the sugars into alcohol. So it's a delicious, warm, sweet uh, drink to give you energy to get you up to the top of the pass where there's a monument dedicated to the song that was sung by the horse handlers as they'd guide their horses up over the pass. And it talks about horses being always able to manage the 32 kilometers or eight li of the pass but on occasion nothing will get you across the very difficult river crossing of the oigawa river which we're going to cross later uh, today
like to remember that ditty and sing it as you're making your way up to the pass and then it's all downhill uh, to the lakeside and perhaps your first glimpses of Mount Fuji. The Tokaido is all about views of Mount Fuji. She's notoriously shy uh, but I'm sure somewhere along your walk you'll get uh, some fabulous views. Um, the walk continues through amazing cedar-lined uh, avenues and uh, you uh, finally get to the post town of Hakone. Now, this was an artificially created town to accompany the board, the uh, barrier station, which was the important checkpoint along the Tokaido to ensure that munitions didn't enter the city of Edo. It was, uh, they were also keen to check that the um, family, female family members of the feudal lords were not escaping uh, from, from Edo. Our guidebook, uh, shows us the cedar line street. Um, the trees are a little bit smaller than what we uh, see today uh, through to the post town, the artificially built post town and the barrier station with those terrifying looking uh, arms at the front of the barrier station. The barrier station has been immaculately reproduced. It's a proper archeological site. Uh, notice Mount Fuji poking out through the back there. Um, the barrier station is painted black, which is the soot of pine mixed in astringent persimmon juice. This prevents the decay of the wood, but it also gives this austere formal atmosphere to this passport checking station. Uh, they'd, the highest ranking guards would greet the feudal lords as they pass through uh, and other shogunate officials. And there are always guns and bows displayed as a symbol of the power of the shogunate and those terrifying implements that we saw still set, stand outside this these would be used to hold down the heads of people who didn't have the right uh, documentation i'm um, hoping that uh, our next visit to japan won't be uh, like this um as you can see in our guidebook in fact uh, when you research uh, what happened at the this barrier station, these implements were used only once or twice in the whole of the, uh, the Edo period. They really were for, for show, just to remind people who was, who was boss. Now in 1980, uh, I stayed at the Matsuzakaya and I kept a, a login, uh, which is sort of a archaic way of saying travel expenses. I didn't uh, ring ahead, so they couldn't provide me with meals and they charged me 5,000 yen. Uh, and this inn still stands today. But we're going to catch the bus down to Mishima and stay the night at Mishima. And uh, we're going to get off the Tokaido just in front of the cherry trees, in front of the Tori gate of the famous Mishima Grand Shrine. The cherry trees are still uh, wonderful. Uh, many different varieties uh, grow in front of the shrine, including these weeping cherries and the Tori gate, gate still stands, which is featured in Hiroshige's woodblock print, which is a beautiful treatment of a morning departure in the mist. And he uses gradations of gray to beautifully display the Tori gate in the mist. Uh, and the, um, the shrine is still a very pleasant visit as well. But our guide points out that the really famous uh, thing about Mishima are the courtesans. <laughs> um, the Mishima courtesans were well regarded along the Tokaido. And so we see them uh, naked to the waist, uh, preparing for the evening. Um, uh, some of them are out on the Tokaido, physically restraining travelers and dragging them into the inn to stay the night. 
this traveler on the left has already agreed to stay and he's taking off his straw sandals and his feet are about to be washed before he steps up on the tatami mats. Um, and I'll translate all of that pre-modern text for you. Uh, as the sun sets, the courtesans of Mishima busy themselves, preparing to entice customers to stay the night. Stripped to the waist, white makeup, beguiling perfumes, rouge and hair oil are applied, the faint perfumes of which float to the street. Hair is piled up and sponges are used with great vigor. Meanwhile, the girls dream up new ways of capturing a customer for the night. Sir, you must be exhausted. Step inside and relax. Singing softly about flowing locks of hair, singing again how their tears barely touch their eyelids on those evenings that you don't visit. Customers who stay the night eventually collapse into the deep sleep of the long distance traveler, but there are devilish fleas and the women stay awake, squashing the fleas for you. A few fleas make their way through their defenses and the itching awakens you. Ah, uh, the deep pathos of travel. Now I can reasonably confidently uh, guarantee that you won't be troubled by fleas in our accommodation. Uh, you will have some uh, wonderful bathing opportunities. And uh, we'll, we've always got excellent suggestions for places to eat at. The famous food of Mishima is eel. And this is because the eel is leached for two to three days in the crystal clear waters of rivers that flow into Mishima, which is snow melt off Mount Fuji, uh, filtered through volcanic rock. And uh, the famous river is the Gembe River, not so far from your hotel. Perhaps an evening stroll is justified. And you might even be lucky enough to see fireflies because of the crystal clear clarity of this, uh, this water. Now, the next morning, we get going to just cross the street to the station. A train leaves every 20 minutes for our next destination, post town Kambara. Now, you'll <clears throat> come straight down to the next post town, Numazu, and turn right. And as you make your way along the Suruga Bay, just look out for the Sembon Pine Grove. Now, the Suruga Bay is the deepest bay in Japan, one of the deepest bays in the world. And this is really the slopes of Mount Fuji continuing on straight down uh, to a depth of two and a half kilometers. Um, now, it's in this pine grove that you'll see off to the left of the train that Yaji and Kita discover that their money has been stolen from their purse. They are holding a beautiful leather uh, lacquer screen printed purse. And the thief, Yaji there has it tied to his belt. The thief has replaced their coins with rocks and they discover that at Numazu. Um, now, Indenya made this uh, purse and they're still making them uh, in Corfu City, uh, Japan. And um, that was Yaji's purse, that beautiful leather purse that you saw. All right. Um, our walking for this day is from Kambara Station on the left across to Okitsu. Fairly flat um, elevation gain of 115 meters, but don't be deceived. This is quite a vertical ascent up to the top of um, at the Sutta Pass. Uh, the road, for the most part, continues to hug the Suruga Bay, 12 kilometers walking today. Now, um, Hiroshige's print is my favorite from this series. 
uh, a, a, a rare snow view along the Tokai door. And yet um, it has such a warm feeling. The, um, when you see the originals, the warmth of this white is, uh, is um, uh, enticing. And I think another reason for the warmth is, of this print is the uh, depiction of the famous lattice work of Kambara, which the town streetscape is still famous for. Uh, you'll see the Honjin, which is where the feudal lords would stay. There are commoners' inns. Now, uh, Izumiya, the family still reside in their family home. You can poke through the glass and see the beautiful staircase that leads to the what was the accommodation upstairs. But the family, who are delightful, um, have opened up a third of their home on the right there as a free uh, rest spot, and they'll give you a free cup of uh, green tea. The head woman of the house would proudly polish her um, lattice work every morning. We continue over the Yui River, which was not allowed to be bridged for defensive reasons, but the locals would always put up planks just to make travel a little bit easier, and these could be hidden away if shogunate officials came along. And our guidebook uh, <clears throat> uh, looks at Satta Pass on the right, and the famous Borgakute tea house on the left. Um, and we'll visit this tea house uh, today. In the distance are the fires of the female divers who are searching for abalone. After diving, they would warm themselves by those, the smoke uh, from the fires there. The far, there, there are the uh, female divers. Abalone is still found along the coastline here. And uh, in the far distance is the Toyozumi Shrine, which is one of two major shrines that worships Mount Fuji. Now, um, our description in our guide, uh, the tea houses of West Kurasawa stand at the eastern foothills of Mount Satta and serve turban shells and abalone. The tea houses are built on a steep cliff looking out towards Mount Fuji. The view is second to none on the Tokaido. One of the tea houses is called Borgakute. Literary luminaries favor this tea house and come calling from all over Japan, often leaving a slip of paper behind with a gift of a splendid poem or prose. The sight of local women collecting abalone on the low tide with Mount Fuji in the background is elegant. Um, we've got a great suggestion for lunch. Another favorite, uh, famous food from the area are these tiny shrimp that are, are fished for in the, um, in the waters of Suruga Bay, sakura shrimp, tiny little shrimp, and they're deep fried in the kakiyage there, top left side. They're um, boiled in the rice on the bottom left, takikomi rice. Um, they're simmered with sugar and soy sauce in the skudani in the top middle there. Um, they're served raw in the sashimi and simmered in the clear soups. So a really delicious tempura lunch for you. They've got other options if you don't like shrimp. Um, just down the street is Yui Shosetsu's home, a well-known um, samurai who was involved in an uprising in the early Edo period, but his family was involved in indigo dyeing and uh, the vaults of the vats of the indigo dyeing process um, are still visible. And they have a little shop of their indigo dyed wares. I can assure you these purses are much cheaper than my suggested uh, indenya purses. These are $20 each. Uh, my leather purses uh, are about $400 each. So you might be cursing me for, um, once you've seen the leather purse, you can't go back. <laughs> Um, just across the road is the Honjin, where the feudal lords would stay. The uh, gate is preserved beautifully, as well as the horse watering trough at the front there, which is unusual. They're usually in the back of the Honjin. Unfortunately, the, the main building no longer survives, and they've built the Hiroshige Art Museum here. They have very 1,200 very good quality prints. And if you time it right, they have the Hoedo original version, which I'm guiding you through today, displayed once a year, just for a couple of weeks because the prints are susceptible to light damage. But um, it's an interesting visit because they describe the printing process. I love the uh, 
presentation about the pigments used by Hiroshige, his famous blues, the indigo blues. Unfortunately, that Kambara print, that beautiful white, thick white paint is lead white. Uh, so it's not uh, such a good pigment to use anymore. And in the gardens is a, a, a tea house that was built by Yamaoka Teshu, who I'll introduce you to in a moment. And uh, it's a lovely place to stop for a while and enjoy a cup of Japanese whisked matcha tea overlooking the gardens. Now, Yamaoka Teshu was the bodyguard of the last shogun of the Edo period. Uh, and Bogakute, our tea house, helped him to uh, secret around the Satta Pass, uh, disguised as a fisherman uh, by boat, to negotiate with Saigo Takamori, the great general who was marching up to intent on destroying Edo Castle and the city. And he brought about a, a meeting between Saigo and Katsu Kaishu, who had become the head of the Meiji uh, Navy, uh, thereby contributing to the non-destructive surrender of the Edo castle to imperial forces and the ending of the Edo period. So this is Nishi Kurasawa. You remember that name from our guidebook. And in another intermediate post town because you're about to start the street steep climb up over Mount Sata. And here we have uh, Borgakute in 2013, the owner of the, uh, the old tea house. This is Lou and myself, Lou mentioned, we did our first research for this trip on, in 2013, had a great time. Uh, dare I say it, being a bit like Yaji and Kita, um, getting up to mischief down the Tokaido. And this uh, lovely lady showed us the secret rooms where Yamaoka Teshu was uh, disguised as a fisherman and made his way around uh, the coastline. This is Satta Pass looking very much, with the exception of the expressway and train line, looking very much like uh, Hiroshige's woodblock print. Uh, the Satta Pass, and we're going to descend now to cross the Okitsu River and into Okitsu post town. Now, Okitsu River is very rare because it has no dams on it. This is very rare for Japan. And so the waters are very clear and uh, the upper reaches the river, uh, very fine fishing waters. And Hiroshige focuses on the river as well uh, with these two sumo wrestlers being carried across the river, teetering, uh, worried about being turfed into, into the river. Now, Okitsu post town was famous for the Minaguchiya Inn. Uh, this is my photograph from 1980. I stayed here and uh, the inn was made favor, famous by Oliver Statler. And so I knew I wanted to stay here. I rang in advance and booked a room. And so they provided me with two meals and that cost me 9,500 yen, which for a 19 year old scholarship student of the national, the Japanese government was a lot of money, I can assure you. Uh, I took a photograph of the grandsons of the owner of that time. Uh, so today the inn is closed. There is a little gallery that you can visit. And these are some of my photos from the gallery. Of course, uh, the novel is promoted Japanese inn published in 1961. This is the author Oliver Statler uh, with the grandfather um, of those boys, uh, Hanjuro san. And the book took America by storm and was a bestseller in 1961. And this is my other suggestion for a must read, delightful read in preparation for your walk. Um, we are going to stay next door to the Minaguchiya at uh, Okaya, but let's visit Seikenji Temple first. Just a quick trip. Um, generations of Korean envoys stayed here. So they have a very large collection of these Hengaku plate, plaques, which were beautiful calligraphy, uh, undertaken by the Korean diplomats and left as thank yous. And this plaque on the front gate is one of those. Uh, it says Tokai Meiku, which means a renowned place of Tokai. And it's a very pleasant visit. And you can uh, see the rooms where the Korean diplomats would stay and look out over the bay. Now, this is little Okaya where uh, 
we're very lucky to stay on tour. Um, so sometimes we adjust, we ask you to adjust the start date just so we can assure you of a stay here. Um, it's otherwise fairly difficult to reserve, but uh, they love Walk Japan and uh, the owner is very proud of her food and has a wonderful chef assisting her in preparing the food for our stays. Now the next day, it's just a short walk down to Okitsu Station uh, to Abekawa. Uh, the train leaves every 40 minutes and it's just 21 minutes down to the Abekawa Station. Now we're not actually going to walk on the Tokaido on this day. Um, the Tokaido is actually this route, which is through trafficked roads and is not particularly pleasant. So you'll understand why we suggest you walk along the wonderful uh, Marikogawa River pedestrian path, particularly uh, in cherry blossom season. And you'll arrive uh, at Mariko Post Town and the famous um, tea house serving Tororojiru, which is grated yam poured over rice and barley. Now, this tea house was originally in the foothills of that mountain in the background. And so Hiroshige created an image of the tea house. And then the owner of the tea house decided to uh, mimic art, which was mimicking his reality by rebuilding his tea house in the exact shape of Hiroshige's woodblock print, print. So it's reality. So it's art mimicking reality, mimicking art. Um, very ple pleasant place. Now, this woodblock print series is now taking from Shanks Mayor because uh, published just before this uh, series was published because Yaji and Kita have a bowl of Tororojiru soup and it's presented to them by a woman with a child on her back. Very uh, wonderful place for lunch. And um, this is the yam, grated yam on the left, very high anti-carcinogenic properties, very good for you. And you pour it over the hot uh, rice and barley mix. Now I love this mix. It's actually sort of a pauper's food in Japan, but I love the texture of the barley, the cooked barley and the rice. Now, um, after lunch, sorry, uh, where's my map? We're going to climb over Utsunoya Pass and we suggest that you um, catch a bus to the trailhead. Now, can I suggest that you just take a moment and walk back along the Tokaido, which you've missed out on, through the post town of Mariko, which is actually um, a very pleasant little stroll through the old post town. And then we suggest you, you can walk if you're keen, uh, if you're striding out, but um, we suggest you take a bus to the trailhead. And this is very interesting walking because we're going to take you over the 17th century Edo period road and then do a loop back on that original 8th century road mentioned in 720 CE. But you'll also see glimpses of a 1920s tunnel, the 1880s tunnel for foot traffic, which we'll insist you go and have a, a, a look at. And then you'll see the 15, 1950s and 1990s massive uh, tunnels for, for road traffic. So from a road history perspective, this is a very interesting afternoon of walking. The trailhead starts at the little Utsunoya village, which is an intermediate post town before you head up to the pass. Um, there are views down on the village and we'll just encourage you to pop across to see the Meiji Tunnel, which is built in beautiful English uh, red brick. And this was for foot traffic, not for vehicles or trains. So very interesting 1880s tunnel. And then back to the Edo period trail and up over the pass and down to this really wonderful park where you continue your stroll along the river to the trailhead of the old 8th century Tokaido, which is called the Tsutano Hosomichi, or the ivory, uh, sorry, ivy narrow road. And um, careful because this is a, a very old road and you'll get to the top. And don't forget at the top to look out. You might see Mount Fuji again, poking through the clouds and then down to the trailhead again, and then onwards by bus 
to our accommodation at Fujieda. <clears throat> Hiroshige features the transport office at Fujieda. We'll provide some comfortable accommodation for you. Now, and of course, suggestions for wonderful dinner, usually in an inviting uh, Japanese izakaya pub. Now, the next day, I might mess up Lou's carefully timed train schedule, but um, stroll down the street and you'll come across this uh, location of this old tea house, which served seto somei, dyed rice. Seto is the, the name of this little district. And you can see the rice being dyed in the background, steamed and dyed, and sold in the foreground, in pressed form. Uh, so it looks like a gold coin. And uh, in that original location, there's still a shop that uh, makes these every morning for sale to walkers. And uh, there's a little museum there as well. The mochi rice is cooked with Cape jasmine seeds, which dyes it this yellow color, and then it's flattened like a, a gold coin. But this is, it's a good snack for morning tea, perhaps. All right, the walk today is 12.6 kilometers, elevation gain of th over 300 meters over some fairly street, steep ascents through the day. And today we cross over the Oi River, uh, this terrifying river that we've already sung about some days where it's going to be in flood and we're just not going to be able to get over. And Hiroshige is obsessed with this river crossing. There's a feudal lord's train here. Um, the package is in disarray. It all has to be carried across by porters. As uh, does our guide focus on this river crossing and all the different ways you can uh, cross over, depending on how much you're willing to pay. Um, there are some people who uh, cross over on the shoulders of the porters. And of course, this was very embarrassing for women. So if you couldn't afford four porters, you might seriously consider walking on the Nakasendo. And uh, if you could afford four porters, you could be carried a bit more comfortably across on a platform uh, like this reenactment. Now, you would buy a waxed piece of paper and present this to a porter, and he would cash these in at the end of the day at their union office. And the cost or number of uh, tokens that you need would depend on the depth of the river. So about $15 for up to the thighs to about $30 if the water is up to the shoulders and any deeper, the uh, river would be closed. The Porter's Union offices have been recreated and restored beautifully. And uh, uh, our next post town, Hiroshige, is still obsessed with this river crossing. Now, because it was such an ordeal to cross the river, uh, we, we, we walk over a bridge today. Um, the intermediate post town of Kikugawa, we'll visit in a moment, was allowed to serve food. And this food was called nameshi dengaku, just a little bit of food sustenance to get you ready for the crossing or to get you uh, over the ordeal of, of the crossing. And the, the famous food was uh, daikon greens boiled in uh, rice. If you ever buy daikon in Australia, they s throw the greens away. That's the most delicious part. Uh, get your grocer to keep them. And, um, and a baked tofu with a sweet miso sauce. Now, there is one restaurant that continues to serve this meal at Kanaya. You walk past it on our, our walk, but it's only open Saturday, Sunday, Monday, so you might miss it. But just to keep in mind that that's a possibility. Uh, and then through Kanaya, up the Edo period paving to our suggested option for lunch at um, the lovely Komorebi Cafe, really warm and inviting inside. The owners are just delightful. And at the very least, you should have their cheesecake and coffee, but they do a good spaghetti as well for lunch. And then on down to Kikugawa, that intermediate post town, literally the Chrysanthemum River 
town. Now, these are all polished uh, river stones from the Kikugawa River. So it's a bit terrifying to walk down. So be careful. Um, everyone is so delighted to be on Edo period paving, but after the first five minutes, they all beg me to avoid Edo period paving. Um, down into Kikugawa, and you see that there's a little dog leg in the village, protective of the town, which is beautifully all described also in our guide. You see the Tokaido dog legging through Kikugawa. Also, our guide tells a very sad story back in the early Kamakura period when there was a dispute, a, a succession dispute in the imperial family. And this uh, uh, aristocrat, um, aristocrats in Japan all have uh, very difficult names, Nakami Kado Sakino Chunagon Muneyuki. He was uh, uh, got caught up in this um, succession dispute and by the new Kamakura shogunate was required to commit suicide. And his last night was spent in Kikugawa. And he wrote a poem on the wall of the uh, of his inn. And uh, the, the poem is in very difficult Chinese. I've provided a Japanese translation then, and my very poor translation is, in old China, the dew of chrysanthemum was the elixir of life. Here, while accommodated on the west bank of the Tokaido chrysanthemum river, a life is ended. So, um, uh, there, his page is crying as he writes this poem. And uh, we pass by his grave and you probably wouldn't notice his, the poem monument in, in the middle there is his sad poem. What's of interest though, are the, other, the river stones from the Kikugawa Chrysanthemum River, which gives the river its name because these stones look like chrysanthemum flowers. I hope you agree. <laughs> and then up, uh, over our first major climb into the depths of the uh, tea fields of Shizuoka uh, Prefecture. The fans there keep off the frost of the new tips of the, the green tea in the spring. We'll pass by QNG Temple, which has the famous night weeping stone. And this is related to a famous story about a, a young girl, Oishi, she works very hard in Kikugawa and she's on her way home, she's pregnant, and she's robbed and killed. And the priest from this temple hears a child crying. So the slashing of the sword has released the child. And the priest raises the child, uh, feeding him on amber boiled starch syrup. And these sweets are still sold along the Tokaido. And they're called kosodate ame, or child raising sweets. Now you'll pass by Oishi's grave along the Tokaido and the original location of the night weeping stone, which is now safely kept in the um, grounds of QNG temple. It actually traveled to Europe to an exposition on <laughs> a, a, amazing uh, travels, but that is where it was originally located. And just remember this location, um, uh, continuing through the wonderful tea, tea fields. And that is Hiroshige's print. So it's almost like you're walking through this woodblock print and the weeping stone is right in the middle of our Tokaido, as it is in our guidebook. You can see the Kosodate Ame suites in the far distance and uh, right in the middle of the highway with people looking at it very um, with wonder is our night weeping stone. We get to Nisaka, which is uh, where our walk concludes. Uh, very pleasant streetscape with many well-preserved Edo period inns, particularly for commoners. But uh, the Kawasakaya is a large-scale inn of such quality that warriors, the samurai, as well as commoners would stay here. And uh, they open with volunteers on occasion. If you're lucky, you might uh, get in to see it, usually on the weekends. And then uh, the, at the entrance to the town where you'll depart 
is the notice board where the warrior class would communicate its rules and any notices with the commoner, the commoners. And uh, we guide you to a location where you're picked up and taken by transport to into the foothills of the nearby hills uh, to a wonderful hot spring where you'll relax and have your last night on tour with us. Um, the following day, you're transported down to uh, Kakegawa post town, which is famous as the approach uh, town to Mount Akiha. Now, Akiha was worshipped uh, for safety against fire. And the lanterns that you see in the woodblock print there are Akiha lanterns. And these were placed in every village and town of Japan through the Edo period. And usually one or two members of the village would be sent on pilgrimage down the Tokaido and off to Akiha to pray at the shrine to ensure safety of the village from fire. Now, Kakegawa is also famous for its kites. If you've got grandkids who love kites, this is the place for you. And uh, uh, they're still made in the, in the city, beautiful Japanese hand-painted painted, uh, kites. And um, the town also has an impressive castle, which you might have time to visit before you get on the train for your onward safe travels. So um, thank you so much. Uh, I've gone over time a little bit, but we've got plenty of time for quick Q&A. Lou will guide us through the chat and I'll stop sharing. The final slide was all about uh, our social media. So please stay in touch with us as Lou will remind you to, but let me stop sharing so we can actually see each other. John, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Am I back? Yes, yes. I'm back. That all was good. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're going um, to you're going to answer all the questions, by the way. No, you're the, the, there's not, you're the expert. Too, there's, not, there's not too many so far, actually. Um, okay, good. And, and I think they're they're all for you, actually. So, oh no. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Number one, number one. It's uh, kind of a, a general question, but uh, what are the pros and cons of, of walking in different seasons? Um, is it is it different for different walks? Well, yeah, it is. But uh, start with the Tokaido, I guess. Yeah. Um, with the Tokaido, um, actually, you know, it's very, very hot in Japan at the moment. Lou's in Hong Kong. Uh, Rachel's in Kyushu. She's dying from the heat and everyone i've spoken to in tokyo in the last couple of days is just expiring in this unseasonably hot uh, climate so i don't know i love summer in japan because of all the festivals but you just have to get used to that humidity uh you know it was 35 or 6 degrees in tokyo yesterday but once you get used to it it's a fantastic time to be in japan but the tokaido lends itself well to walking even in the colder months, because that's the Pacific side of Japan is, is warm and fairly free from snow, even though in late March, I got stuck in the snow in Hakone in 1989. Global warming, that may not happen anymore. Um, of course, you've got the cherry blossom season, which I've sold a bit through this morning's talk. But honestly, it's a bit more crowded at that time. Um, I'd say for our Basho walk, I love the autumn season. The, the colors of the, the north in autumn are wonderful. Um, perhaps a little less so for the Tokaido, but um, it's probably less crowded at that time of year along the Tokaido. So um, thanks for that question. We always get asked it and I never satisfactorily answer. So <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No, I, like, I like the Tokaido in the winter months. I mean, it's the, it's the best chance of the views of Fuji as well. Uh, if that's what you absolutely. use, absolutely. The clear days and a, a sunshiny day, winter day along the along the coast is a is a good one. Um, um, perhaps some okay. Next question. Perhaps something that is better done in a follow up um, a follow up email. But anyway, um, one of our attendees says what a delightful presentation with Hiroshige's Ukiyo-e and the guidebook as illustrations and a guide. Please list the titles of the recommended readings. Oh, okay. Yes, let's... Um, uh, the titles of recommended readings. Uh, well, the, prep, the two books that I Did recommended, that. we can um, put in 
the follow-up email to you, perhaps Rachel, the um, Shanks Mayor. Both the books are in Japanese in, so you'll you'll find those. Both are available on Kindle, um, so they're very cheap to purchase. And uh, but um, uh, when you come on the tour, we also have a a, a more significant. Um, reading list for you. But uh, the two books that I mentioned today, we can certainly put in in an email, follow-up email. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, next question. Do many of the people encountered speak English? For example, the inn owners. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Okaya-san, um, so uh, she doesn't speak English, but she communicates perfectly with us she's just such a warm delightful person and so even though you don't understand what she's saying you understand um and she often puts on a tea ceremony for us uh, in the the in the inn of an evening and uh so uh language is is not a problem it's the 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 depth of her welcoming and uh, just the warm atmosphere. Um, Walk Japan, we provide a PH, PhD thesis on <laughs> how to act in Japan and how to, to uh, use the, the, the public baths. And uh, so you're well prepared for staying an evening in one of these types of traditional inns. And uh, I think that's what is so special about our uh, our arranging of these tours is that you do have the chance to stay in these in these inns. Okaya, um, the current owner's father, was uh, received the call from the Minaguchiya, telling him that they were going out of business, and it was those naughty kids who were the ones who decided to close the business. I'm furious with them. I'm um, <clears throat> if I knew when I took that photograph that they were going to be so terrible and not. Uh, uh, respect the great traditions of their family business. I would have uh, had a stern talking to them. Um, but uh, yes, the Okaya received the, the call saying the Minaguchiya was going to, to close. So she has a generations of history of operating an inn on the Tokai door. So it's very special to stay there. And language is not a problem. Okay, a couple of questions coming up now, which maybe I, I can answer. Um, the first one is, do we offer tours in autumn? The answer is absolutely. Yes, we do. I mean, the Tokaido Wayfarer is, I mean, we'll give you a heat warning in, um, in the summer if you decide to undertake it. But, um, but th this particular um, tour uh, will be offered uh, all year round. For, for anybody who, who wants to, to participate in that. And, and certainly the autumn. I mean, this particular autumn, uh, we, we are offering, uh, uh, we, we, are, we are providing some, some Wayfarer tours and we're providing one guided tour as well. Um, I mean, again, we're, we're sort of battling to get everything back on track after such a long period of downtime. But um, the, 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 the more we get back, the more we can offer at more times of the year. Um, another question, um, can the Tokaido Wayfarer be broken with a day off along the way? The answer is yes, it, yes, it can. If you, if you tell us at the outset which day you'd like to go off and do something else, we'll, we'll simply leave a, a gap in that schedule. Um, or even book you two nights at the same accommodation. Um, if you're staying more than two nights at a traditional accommodation, it can get a bit tricky because they've got certain things that they, they've got certain menus that are appropriate to certain times of year. And, and, and it can become very challenging to produce a, a menu for more than two days in a row that is, that is different and doesn't sort of uh, challenge um, the, the people at the inn. Um, a bit too much, but certainly a day off along the way is is no problem at all. That's fine. Uh, just let us know at, at when you want to um, when you want to book it. Um, Paul, who's on the call, our CEO says, given the growth of new accommodation, perhaps the Minaguchi could be revived by interested parties. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's all intact, uh, and there's this little. Um, uh, gallery 
which is uh, open to the public. But the rest of the building is being used by a very large local company from Shimizu, which is a uh, shipping company, uh, as their sort of um, uh, rest accommodation for their employees. So it's very, oh, brilliant idea, Paul. <laughs> Let's do it. That's great. Um, let's see, anything else? Let's have a look. Um, no, I think we've um, possibly ex exhausted the questions. We've still got a lot of participants with us. So that's wonderful. Thank you to John and, and, and thank you to everybody else for joining us and participating. Um, a heads up um, to people, of course, we'll, we'll send the usual email out, but our next Talk Japan event will be on Thursday, the 28th of July. Um, that will be on tour with Pascal, um, who will be doing a talk on, on our Basho tour. Basho Tohoku, the narrow road to the north. Something else that, that John is a, a, is a complete expert in, but, um, but uh, Pascal will be doing that talk for us on on that day so thursday the 28th of july 11 a.m japan time um fortunate for those of you on on this side of the world i think um yeah, thank you once again again we will be posting this to our social media and um and and um and keeping in touch with everybody um somebody's offered that they loved the basho tour and um, i'm just reading the comments as they come and thank you for a great talk as always um very good. Okay, thanks everybody. We'll we'll leave it there. Wishing you all a, a great rest of the day or, or evening, wherever you are. And